I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Galatians. I am elated because I get to preach early today, and I want you to turn to chapter 5 of Galatians, verses 1 through 15. These verses are on the screen. If you don't have your Bible, look at your Bible if you have it with you. We're going to talk about freedom and what freedom is for. If you are new, we are in the book of Galatians. We started a series at the beginning of the summer. This is week 12 in our series, Free for the Taking, The Triumph of Grace in the Gospel. And this is called, number 12, Freedom and the Law of Love. Freedom and the law of love. Before we read, look up here for a minute. How many of you are free in Christ? Do you know what you are free for? I know you know what you're free from, but do you really understand what freedom is about? Let's read these texts this morning. These verses will help us discover that. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the entire law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified By the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision uh, counts for anything but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish... Though This is in the Bible. I'm not inserting this. I'm sorry. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. There's only one way to account for this. Paul was not a very loving man. You have to account for that. He had his fleshly problems. That was one of them. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Amen. I was reading the work of a sociologist. You probably never heard of him. You can find him on the World Wide Web. His name is Robert Bala, and he's very well known because he's done the most extensive studies in the modern world on the American character. Essentially, Bala's research asks the simple question, what is the essential or core characteristic that defines the American character? Character. In other words, when Bala was asking, when you break down Americans and try to get the essential core characteristic of Americans, what stands out the most? And you will not be surprised in knowing that Bala discovered that the core characteristic that that characterizes most Americans is freedom. In his research and in the article I read, He talked about Americans' long-standing allegiance to individualism, the belief that the good society is one in which individuals are free to pursue their own private satisfactions independently of others, a pattern of thinking that emphasizes individual achievement and self-fulfillment. If you didn't understand any of that, it's simple. I'm free to do whatever I want. 
to pursue my dreams financially, socially, whatever I want. Not surprisingly, Bala and his researchers trace this characteristic all the way back to our country's 18th century founders, who when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, promised, quote, an unheard of degree of individual freedom, an unlimited opportunity to compete for material well-being and an unprecedented limitation on the powers of government to interfere with individual freedom, though many would say in the modern age, in our day, that is eroding. Now think about it, today as we meet here, we have enjoyed as Americans this freedom our forefathers fought to achieve and to protect. There's one thing though that Bala mentions that is often forgotten today about our forefathers who forged our government, and it is this. Our forefathers assumed, Bala says, that the freedom of individuals to pursue their own ends must be tempered by a concern for the common good, what they called public spirit. In simple layman's terms, their view of freedom was that it was a freedom for the common good. And today, we have almost totally lost that understanding of freedom. He, in an article I read entitled, Creating the Good, Good Society, the authors commenting on our view of freedom today say it is precisely this sense of common purpose and public spirit that is absent from our society today. A ruthless, a ruthless individualism expressed primarily through a market mentality has invaded every sphere of our lives, undermining our institutions such as the family or the university. In other words, Bala, in his research, it boiled down to one reality. Americans want freedom from, not freedom for. The American concept of freedom, he says, is I want what I want, when I want it, and nobody can tell me otherwise. By the way, in a society where no longer the common good is the focus, the only way to curb the excesses of individual freedoms is by writing and trying to enforce laws. Which is why, by the way, that our, book, our books and our governments, local state governments, are filled with laws that are never enforced as we continue to write thousands of new laws, some of which will never be enforced. In fact, this blew my mind, but in your own state of Tennessee, did you know on the books in Tennessee that it's illegal to catch a fish with a lasso? And I know, because I saw two guys, I saw police chasing two guys on Kingston Pike in the back of a lack saying, we're fishing. That's in the books. I'm, I'm serious. I'm not making this up. Or did you know in Dyersburg, Tennessee, it's illegal for a woman to call a man for a date? I bet I just, any single brothers who are thinking of moving to Dyersburg, I just dissu dissuaded. Or how about this? Did you know on the books in Tennessee, it is illegal to shoot any game other than a whale from a moving automobile? <laughs> I saw two guys in the back of a truck on Middlebrook going, there she blows! <laughs> I mean, this is, this is a law. You, can, you cannot, it is illegal to shoot any game, but you can shoot a whale on Middlebrook Pike if you happen to see one. And this explains a lot. Did you know in Memphis, not making this up, in Memphis it is illegal for a woman to drive a car unless there is a man either running or walking in front of it waving a red flag to warn approaching motorists and pedestrians. That may be why Lisa Marie never left the, 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 the mansion, I don't know. Now Paul, 
This idea of law curbing individual excesses speaks to our passage that we read this morning. Paul will labor in these verses what we modern Americans have forgotten about our own constitution, and that is the freedom of the gospel which Christ achieved by his death and resurrection is not freedom from only, it is essentially freedom for. And it's not difficult to know why Paul has to address that. No doubt the false teachers who came to Galatia said something like this, that unless you believers start living under the Jewish law, with all of its strictures, there's like 613, unless you live under the law, you will be tempted to excess. You will live lawless lives and you will be immoral. The technical term is libertine. You won't care anymore how you live and you will throw off all restraint. And the only way to curb that is you Gentiles need to become good Jews and keep the law of Moses. Paul will tell us in this chapter, no way, Jose. He said it in Hebrew. Uh, he says that faith in the gospel empowers men not by putting them under rules and regulations, but by transforming them, by allowing them to receive the glorified spirit who now abides in men's hearts and makes them love God and love one another. And rather than being lawless, any man who is led by the Spirit will live the law of Christ, which is the law of love. For Paul, it's not the law of Moses that curbs lawlessness. It is the glorified Spirit of Jesus residing in hearts. And when men trust Jesus Christ, He so changes them that they walk differently than where they walked before. He starts in verses two by four through four saying, I almost said two by four. <laughs> he starts by saying, there's only two ways to try to be right with God, faith or work. So if you guys go the route of saying, we're gonna be circumcised, then he reminds them you are under obligation to keep the whole law. And of course, they can't keep the law, so this pathway is the sure pathway to condemnation. Any of you who are under legalism or have been under legalism know there's never a moment when you feel you've really achieved the righteousness you seek. You always find somewhere you came up short, somewhere you broke a rule, somewhere you blew it. I used to pray six hours a day and hear a voice at the end saying, couldn't you do eight? And if I would have done eight, I would have heard, well, you could have prayed all. I mean, there was never an end where I felt I've achieved it. I always f found out some area I'm missing. And Paul wants them to know that this is serious. How serious? If they seek to be justified by law, they are severed from Christ and have fallen away from grace. For Paul, it's very simple. It can't be Christ and circumcision, Christ and something else. It is Christ alone when it comes to eternal salvation. Paul says this is how we live in juxtaposition to that. That's how legalism portrays it. And now here's in verse 5 the opposite of legalism. It is how God wants believers to live. Get this. He says we in this verse. He said you legalists, uh, they live like this. But we true Christians live like this. And I'm paraphrasing the verse. He says we wait in faith through the Spirit for the full realization of God's righteousness. And each phrase in that precious statement needs to be savored like fine wine. It's such a powerful statement. First of all, we live by faith in justification, in contrary to human effort or legalism. We trust what God did rather than try to do something on our own. Number two, he says, we eagerly wait. One translation says, we eagerly wait for the full realization of our salvation. What is called in verse five by Paul, the hope of righteousness. This is often referred to as eschatological salvation. Now we talk a lot about faith in the church, and we should. 
We live by faith, not by works. Faith is important. But we don't talk enough about hope. Eschatological salvation means that when you got saved and put your faith in the Lord Jesus, you received in your breast and mind a blessed hope, a coming day when your full acquittal that you are freed from the penalty of sin will be announced and declared before the righteous judge. Now, by faith, we are righteous by an imputed righteousness, but how many know that process or that reality gives way to a process called sanctification in which not only do we stand justified declared justified by the great judge now, but then he begins to deliver us from the power of sin so that one day we will stand. Now, I personally do not believe the Bible teaches that you can live in perfection. That I believe there is a day coming when we will be delivered from the presence of sin, but the blessed hope, my friends, is that one day before the Holy One of God, He will declare us righteous before the universe. He's doing a work in us now. Remember this. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. How did she make herself ready? It was given to her. She can't be ready unless something's given to her first. What was given to her? Righteousness. Fine linen, righteousness. We borrowed it. You don't have it. I don't have it. But we got it imputed to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, listen to this. She made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts. Different word. Righteous acts. You have in this verse both imputed and imparted righteousness. Here is what it is. It's simple. Here's how the bride is making herself ready. She is given righteousness as a gift, and she stands totally righteous before her lover. But that process, that declaration of righteousness yields to a process called sanctification where I'm being made righteous and one day I'll be part of that beautiful bride who will stand pure and clean before the Lord and my fine linen is not just imputed righteousness, it's the righteous acts of the saints. Changed lives. Paul calls it the hope of righteousness. He isn't doubting whether he's righteous. He has this hope of righteousness. In fact, it's so important to know this, that Paul says in Romans 8 that we were saved in hope. Then he goes on and says that we wait, we through the Spirit by faith eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. And here he introduced his first real reference to the Holy Spirit. He did refer to the Spirit doing miracles in their midst and supplying them with the Spirit back in chapter 3. But here he introduces the Spirit as the power in order to live in the Christian life and have this hope and be focused on it as a reality. And I'm not going to say anything about that because next time in two weeks when we get back in Galatians, he is going to explain this in depth when he tells believers there is only one way to live the Christian life and it is by walking by the Spirit and not gratifying the desires of the flesh. And we will talk about that. But then he reminds them of why they were free. And I want to focus the remaining minutes on this because I fear that we fall into the Galatian error, that we are men and women that often abuse freedom and think it's about me. It's about what I get, how happy I am, what it means to me. And these verses are very important. In fact, they are some of the most important verses to describe community how we should live in the community of the redeemed, not just what we do on Sunday morning for an hour, but these verses give us our MO, why we are in the body of Christ and how we should navigate. 
And he says, circumcision and uncircumcision are nothing. Do you know how radical that is? For a Jew to say outward signs in the body which God inaugurated, that came from God, Paul says it's meaningless. Circumcision means nothing. Uncircumcision means nothing. What you do or what you don't do has no bearing. The only thing that counts, and here's how the NIV say it, says it, is faith expressing itself through love. Circumcision, meaningless. Uncircumcision, meaningless. What is meaningful is you're living by faith, and that faith is producing a fruit in your life of love for men and women around you. We're going to have an opportunity now to do this. Take my pulse, see how I'm doing. Because faith is presented in this verse as the root and love is the fruit. By the way, this will be confirmed in two weeks when Paul says the fruit of the Spirit. And the first thing he says, the fruit of the Spirit, is love. And this corresponds perfectly with the book of First John. First John is very simple. John gives you some tests to see if you're truly converted. Read 1 John. Somebody said to me recently they hated this book. But 1 John is amazing. And, and Paul take, uh, John takes him through this book and says, here's seven tests that you can take to see if you're really in Christ. And the, the greatest one, the most important one, John tells us to take our pulse and ask, how are we doing with loving people? The brothers. Now, how many have discovered something? I mean, really. If community is nothing more than full gospel bear, bear hugs and back slaps for 10 minutes at the coffee bar, I can love you. But how many have discovered love is not easy? Love is sacrificial. Love is a feeling, which our culture thinks it is, is you know, we call it sloppy agape. But the love of God is described in 1 Corinthians 13, the highest maturity that men and women can, can reach in Christ is to love one another truly. And John says, whether or not you love the brethren is a test to whether or not you believe the gospel. And all of us can improve in this area. As Paul tells the Thessalonians, you do love the brothers, but I urge you to excel more and more. Trinity, listen to me. Everybody look at me. Let's love one another. Love overlooks sin. It, it, I don't mean by that that it never deals with it, but love covers people. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not boastful. Love gives people grace. We are called to be a loving community. And Jesus said, it's not time it's not uh, our buildings. It's not our programs. He says the world will be convinced of the reality of the gospel if we love one another. We've, we've said that's not true. Our programs, our buildings, our, our stuff will convince the world. Guess what? It doesn't work. The love of God, evident by the way we endure one another, love one another, patiently care for one another, that, Paul says, or, or, uh, Jesus said, will convince the world. In a word, justification by faith is by faith alone, but true justification is never alone. It is evident in a changed life that produces good fruit. Ephesians 2.10 says, we were created in Christ Jesus as his workmanship for good works, which God ordained beforehand that we should walk in them. Now the verses I want to focus on for a few minutes here at the end. First Paul says, you guys were running well, you got off track. He uses a metaphor he uses everywhere in Scripture of a race. He says, you were on the track, you were running, it was good, you were making headway, and then something happened and got you off track. How many of you have ever noticed that with believers? It's amazing to me. 
I mean, I've seen it so many times where someone's running well and then he falls into a weird church or someone gives him a weird book and he gets off track. I worked with a church in North Carolina and it was a powerful church, a community of people, many hundreds of people living in community. I used to go there often. And then they got a book on healthy eating. Now, how many know healthy eating is a good thing? <laughs> I, 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 I was expecting some response. Forget this sermon, let's go to Leviticus 14. By the way, I, I just want to lovingly say, you know, no, I'm not going to say it. If you're eating stuff where there's more nutrients in the box than what's in it, you're going to be sick. So there's, there's value in this. And this church, this church realized from this book that they needed to change their diet. They did. They became healthy and focused on healthy eating. Is that a good thing? It's a good thing. Some of us can, need to consider that. I'm serious. We eat foolishly in our world. We eat fried foods. We drink pop and we think we're going to be healthy and we just need a basic wisdom. You don't have to go freaky on it. But what happened in this church is this became their gospel. It got so bad, I am not kidding, that if you went to an elder for counsel and said, I'm battling lust, the first thing they'd ask you is, what are you eating? I'm serious. Have you had a chocolate bar lately? How many of you wish that that was all you needed to change in your battle with the flesh? Yeah, I'm really, my sanctification's improved markedly since I went to post toasties. <laughs> Jesus, Paul says this persuasion that got you off track, that got you away from Jesus, didn't come from him who called you. How many have noticed that about error? At the time you're pursuing error, it never appears to be error. It appears to be a more mature, sophisticated way than the average saint. This is the deeper life club. We've gotten, we're into the law. Uh, we love the Jewish, we have insight. And, uh, and you, you lesser Christians, you know, you don't have what we have. And Paul says, this error is like leaven. It spreads through the whole body. They even accused Paul, apparently, of teaching circumcision. He says that, my brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Now, what's interesting is Paul took Timothy and, and circumcised him. His father was a Greek. His mother was Jewish. He circumcised him. Paul will do that for the gospel in terms of uh, uh, making sure he isn't offensive to those who's listening. But Paul is not circumcising Timothy because he wants Timothy to come back under the law of Moses. And his opponents probably told the Galatians that Paul still circumcised. We know he circumcised Timothy, for example. And Paul said, in his defense. If I'm preaching circumcision, how come I'm still persecuted? Paul, as a Jew, was hated by Jews because he didn't preach circumcision. So he says, well, if you think I'm preaching circumcision, how come the Jewish people still hate me and oppose me from city to city? Because he says, the reality is, if I'm preaching an outward thing as a sign of the gospel, then the offense of the cross has been removed. Do you understand that statement? Why has the offense of the cross been removed if he's preaching circumcision? Author Thomas Schreiner says, quote, the message of the cross is a scandal or a stumbling block because it is an affront to human pride. Human beings take umbrage in being told that even their best works are stained with evil, that everything they do is insufficient to be right with God, and that the only basis for right standing with God is the cross of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you're trusting in church attendance, moral living, trying to be a better person and you still believe the lie that those things, if I ever accomplish them, will guarantee me entrance into heaven. You are deceived. 
only by men, when men and women trust God's provision of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross can they be saved. So Paul says, if I am preaching circumcision, the offense of the cross has been removed because it's an offense to tell Jews the only hope for you is a Jewish carpenter who was the Messiah, who was born and who was raised in Galilee and died a terrible life crucified as a criminal, and that is the only hope of righteousness. That is an offense to Jews and to good people. But then Paul says something really offensive. I was joking with you, I hope you know. It's a very loving thing. I wish that those who are telling you to be circumcised and unsettling you, I wish they would just their knives would slip when they're circumcising and they would emasculate themselves. Isn't that a pleasant Sunday morning verse? What did your pastor talk about in church today? Well, yeah. Well, that's not very loving. Sometimes the most loving thing a person can do is be offensive. I mean, come on, Jesus, talking to the most, the religious leaders of his day, you brood of vipers, you snakes. Here, Paul says, I, I wish you would just mutilate yourselves, emasculate yourselves. You know, you know, 1 John 4 says God is love. It doesn't say love is God. Don't get them mixed up. So we have this idea, love is God. So I have to be loving, so I can never confront anybody or say anything, because a loving person is just tiptoe through the tulips. <laughs> I was Tiny Tim in a former life. <laughs> but we flip it on its head. Instead of saying God is love, we say love is God, and we have an idea, therefore, what love looks like, so love is never going to say anything offensive. But there's a time when you're dealing with error that's destroying a church and it is, uh, it, it is rampant and it is going to destroy the gospel where it takes somebody. You don't go in and go, oh, I love you. Would you guys pray about this? Paul's an apostle and he will deal with anything that attacks the gospel of the grace of God. And he says, I'd rather have you guys dead than mess with the gospel. Somebody said, well, that's harsh. And my response is, yes, and it needs to be. I mean, Jesus said to his prime apostle, he called him Satan. The guy who just confessed Jesus a minute ago, and now he says, you're Satan. In one sentence, Jesus said, blessed are you for saying this, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my fire. Father, shut up, you devil. It was in the same paragraph. Don't make love God. God is love, and what God does is loving. And sometimes a loving God wipes out the entire planet in a flood. And that's good because God deemed it, and it's loving because God's the judge. We, what we've done in the church is idolatry. We don't like certain qualities of God, like sovereignty or holiness. So we, we sort of diminish that, but we play up love. We like that. And so in all of our presentations of the gospel, I'd like to offend you right now. I mean this. Uh, I, I, I want to be careful, but I, I, I don't mean to offend you. I mean, but it might. I've checked all the sermons in Acts. I've not found one where the preacher goes, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Would you like to accept Jesus? I find guys standing up and saying, Jesus of Nazareth is God's king. He's the Messiah. He died. He rose from the dead. He sits at the right hand of God. You're under judgment and on your way to hell unless you repent and believe the gospel. Repent and do something about it. That's in the Bible. Don't use Revelation 3. Behold, I stand there. That's Jesus knocking on the door of a church. Jesus is not standing out in the rain knocking, saying, will you please let me in? I'm really happy. There's not many that want me. Would you please, you know. And I'm not saying God doesn't love people. He does. God so loved the world. But understand what love is. And the most loving thing you can tell somebody 
who's not a Christian is the need to repent and turn to God. Finally, wow, I'm getting out on time. This is great. In our final hour, I'd like to... <laughs> I'd like to remind you, and this is, if you heard nothing else, I want to end on this note, that liberty cannot, is not, license. Like Americans who think freedom is from rather than for, Christians fall into the trap of thinking I'm free from without understanding what I'm free for. In verse 13, he reminds them they're free from the law. They have been freed from attempting to be right with God on the basis of human performance. They are called for, to liberty, but now in the clearest statement yet, he tells them what freedom is for. He casts it in a negative light. Do not use, listen to me church, do not, do not, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Christians must not allow their freedom in Christ to become a beachhead for the armies of indulgence to gain a foothold in their lives. The term flesh here is our entire identity in Adam outside of Christ. And believers are no longer in Adam. Don't tell people you're in the flesh. You're in, I, some people think we're werewolves. Romans 8 says you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's not to say you can't act fleshly, but you will never not act fleshly if you walk around thinking you're a werewolf. I'm the new man, I'm the old man. I'm in the flesh, I'm in the spirit. You're not a werewolf. When the Holy Spirit entered your life, Paul says you are no longer in the flesh. Get it right. But we live in the period between the times. The present has invaded the future. We're almost in the future when the Lord appears, but he hasn't yet, so we're living in the present. And that means that uh, living in accord with the flesh in our thinking and attitude is still a possibility. And Paul is warning them not to be deceived so that they think freedom is a pretext for fleshly indulgence. You know how this works. People begin to understand grace. Well, let me personalize it. I remember the first few years I was a Christian, I couldn't watch TV. That and bowling were sinful. And TV was sinful. It really was. And I remember, I remember the day when I first realized that I could watch TV and possibly not miss the rapture. And tune into the show tomorrow, we're going to talk about the rapture. Or as I affectionately refer to it, the rupture. So I was free. Praise Jesus. I can watch the world news. And I love Lucy. But then I had to learn something. I'm free to watch TV, but all, uh, not all things are now lawful, but not all things are profitable. There's some channels you got to move past very quickly, brothers. Not stop and say, am I really seeing that? Is that really happening? No, I don't, it must be. Well, let me go back and... So I was free to watch TV, but I was not free to indulge my flesh by watching what I think today is almost pornographic on regular TV. It's amazing. And if you think that you can just watch this stuff and you're in Christ, you have this ability to not be affected, you're stupid. Sorry. Now, legalists tell people that they're free, but if you tell people they're free too much, they'll want to sin. So don't give it to them. Don't play it up too much. Downgrade it. You're free, but. But the truth is, and, and legalists say, so what we need to do is put rules on people. Give them rules. Give them lots of rules. How do you think the Pharisees got to this point? Because in Judaism, in the Torah, one day a year of fasting was required. One day. You know how many fasts there were in the first century? that the Pharisees demanded men and women obey two a week, 104. Required, 
God gave one. Man says, that's, anybody can do that. Let's give him 104. And I lived that way for a long time. Steve and I used to fast. Uh, we, we used to talk about, I'd fast and we'd fast and then all of a sudden a voice, we'd eat and the voice would go, you blew it. Remember that? I mean, and then, I'm not negating fasting. There's a place and time and it's biblical to fast. But, but, but what legalists do is we need rules. We need all kinds of, uh, you know, and people were told we'll rebel against these rules. Let me tell you something. The only thing that will keep you is not rules, it's loving Jesus. If I love Jesus, I'll be faithful to my spouse. If I love Jesus and I'm single, I won't fornicate. If I love Jesus, I won't get drunk. I don't do these things because I'm under rules that says you can and can't. I do it out of love for God and others. Now here's the last statement I wanna make. We read this about freedom and we go, praise God, I'm free to do whatever I want. And Paul says, praise God, you're free now so you can serve others and meet their needs. Now you can do what God wants. And Paul says, true freedom enslaves you in love to others. True freedom liberates believers from their selfish living so that they find their joy in serving God and it manifests serving God in serving others. How do I know if I'm living in grace? I'm serving others. I have a passion. I just want to say this. I hope this doesn't offend you. And Paul, what Paul said, I want to ditto. We're going to start recognizing in our services areas of ministry. We have incredible servants here. But you know what I'd like to do is I would like to banish the word volunteer from the body of Christ. When you signed up for Jesus, you became his slave. I became his slave. There shouldn't be a ministry in Trinity that's not served properly because we all are slaves looking to serve. And the Bible doesn't call us volunteers, it calls us slaves. Sometimes we think we can serve Jesus and not serve others. Paul says, when you love others, you are fulfilling the law which says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I'll end on this note. By the way, that statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, do not buy into theology that says, well, I can't love people yet because I haven't learned to love myself. You do love yourself in accordance with the scripture. Paul is not talking about self-hatred and until you can look in the mirror and go, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. <laughs> what Paul means and what Jesus means and what the Old Testament means is every human being lives with an inherent self-interest and he says, just as you love yourself and are interested in yourself, so you should do the same for others. This is not a call to find some kind of self-love which will allow me to love others. By the way, uh, it assumes that we do love ourselves. I don't know about you, I don't want to assume, but my problem isn't that I don't love myself enough, I love myself too much! Sometimes I'm blind to what people need around me, and I want to be more loving. And the alternative to this is found in verse 16. How many have ever been part of a church like this? We bite and we devour one another. He ends, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Sometimes you have to leave church life to meet, meet Jesus because it's, it, the atmosphere of a community is biting and devouring. And notice that all these verses in chapter 5 into chapter 6 deal with one reality Paul's dealing with, community. Living in community. Don't bite and devour one another. If you think that freedom now allows you to be free to fiercely criticize everyone and everything and hate people, you don't know freedom at all. You're in bondage. If poisonous speech erupts from our mouths and remains unchecked, the church, Paul says, will be destroyed. We had a wonderful group yesterday of new partners. We were here from nine till almost three with our new partners and we talked about gossip and slander. We take a real, uh, uh, amount of time to talk about what we expect of partners in the community and we talk about how 
deadly gossip and slander is when people bite and devour. It, it destroys the unity of the body of Christ. Paul now will tell us the alternative. In two weeks, we'll take it up. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. How many have at least come in Christ enough to know there's a war inside your breast and mine. Anybody experiencing that? I love you, I hate you. <laughs> I mean, there's battles going on. And the answer in living the Christian life is not 50 sessions of inner healing. It is to learn how to walk in the Spirit. Look, I don't know how to say it. I'm, I, I'm sorry if this... I'm neurotic. If I live in the flesh, Shelley bears witness. It's a Jewish thing. If I live in the flesh, I'm neurotic. When I live in the spirit, I'm fine. When I walk in the spirit, I am living in the spirit. Paul will say, if you live by the spirit, let us also walk. When I conduct my life in the spirit, I'm cool. Right? <laughs> Shelley will be at the coffee bar. I won't be there today. Could you elaborate on this? Should, you can ask Shelly later, but. So, we'll take up, I'd like you to read that passage over the next two weeks. Galatians 5, I think it's 16, through the end of the chapter. Paul describes this battle going on, but when we live or walk by the Spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. I'd like you to stand. Just gonna have the team come up our prayer team, if you have any needs this morning, I'm going to move you. I want to release you to get into your day. But maybe you're here this morning and you've realized in this message or maybe in other messages or whatever, the Holy Spirit has made real to you that you've put your trust for salvation in something other than the grace of God which comes through Jesus Christ, that you are trusting church attendance, moral living, reformation, promises to change, all of this stuff, it won't fly, folks. If you're here this morning and you really aren't sure you're a Christian, how do I become a Christian? You start by recognizing that nothing you can do, church attendance won't do it, moral living, it doesn't work. You must confess that you are a sinner. We went, well, a large part of our gospel instruction in our new partners classes, we doctrinally take apart the gospel we preach here. We talk in length about being under the wrath of God and being uh, alienated from God. Your problem if you're not a Christian this morning is not that you smoke and drink and uh, go to questionable movies. That's a fruit. The root is you're alienated from God and religion cannot help you. Come this morning. If you want someone to pray with you and explain the gospel to you, we're offering that as well. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we release your people, maybe there's some here this morning, Lord, that the gospel is awakening their heart. It's convicting them of sin. Maybe they think they were saved, but they've realized they're not and they're lost and on their way to an eternal damnation. Lord, rescue men and women in this service this morning. I pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit of God would convict of sin and quicken faith in their hearts to believe the gospel. Lord, uh, maybe they need to talk with someone and understand this process and what baptism is. Just awaken people. And this morning, Lord, we pray that the grace of, and the freedom of the gospel would check our hearts to recognize that we shouldn't live as slaves to ourselves but teach us how to become slaves to one another. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen.